Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Mel Taylor from um, GADMAC uh, Organising Committee and welcome to day six of uh, our conference. I, the next speaker is Yvonne Nadler and she's going to be talking about all hazards preparedness for the exotic animal industry. We're very privileged to have Yvonne with us today and if you're interested to hear more about her, her or her presentation, you can look at the speaker area on our website for more information. Before we start, I've just got a few housekeeping points. So you'll find that the Zoom chat function is disabled for this webinar. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A section and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. We'd like to encourage you to use the um, hashtag GADMConf for Twitter and social media. And there'll be a short evaluation at the end of the session uh, as you leave. And just as a reminder, we are recording these sessions. We will be editing these and making them available in July when we have a GADMAC awards ceremony, um, also the launch of the Australian Journal of Emergency Management Special Edition. So without further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Yvonne Nadler. Thank you, Yvonne, and over to you. Well, thank you, Mel. And um, I want to talk with you all today. I'm really thrilled to discuss a topic that I'm really passionate about, and that's all hazards preparedness for the exotic animal industry. And I wanna thank Steve and Mel and all the organizers of this um, fabulous conference uh, for, for putting in the time to put this all together. Hold on. So I like to start a lot of my trainings um, and meetings with a quote from a friend of mine, and it's Mr. Terry Lincoln. He's the director of the Dakota Zoo. And this was a quote that he gave in the New York Times um, after he was assisting with um, a, an evacuation of a small zoological facility back in 2011. And it's, you know, if you're picking up furniture and throwing it on a truck, anybody can do that. But in a zoo setting, you can't take someone off the street and say, go get a 500 pound lion. It just doesn't work that way. And for those of you that work with wildlife, work with exotics, you understand exactly what we're talking about here. <clears throat> it's a different skill set, uh, a different set of challenges. So that's why I'm so passionate about um, you know, discussing this topic with you today. So I'm the Senior Veterinary Advisor for a program known as ZAP, and that's the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership. And myself and Ms. Ashley Zielinski, is, who is the program manager, make up the core ZAP team. And Ashley's the one that really keeps all the plates spinning in the air. And depending on the project, um, we involve volunteers and sometimes contractors to help us deliver the projects that we're working on. It all depends on the skill that's needed to complete the, the project. And currently, Ms. Sharon Stewart, formerly of uh, North Carolina Agriculture Emergency Management, is assisting us with several surveys and industry meetings, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So what is ZAP? It's funded via cooperative agreement between the United States Department of Agriculture and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, to work on issues of mutual concern. We disseminate information, develop tools, and make connections across the industry for use by the industry. Now make no mistake, ZAP is not a boots on the ground response unit. We try to connect subject matter experts in animal emergency management with our industry, and we do include our entire industry. We kind of coined this praise, exact phrase, excuse me, exotic animal industry with the help of Dr. Jimmy Tickle, and who some of you may, may know, um, to be based on species we manage rather than any association that we do or don't belong to. It's a very, very diverse group, vastly different budgets and business models. To some folks, the word industry is an unfavorable term, but we have a dairy industry, we have a pork industry. And I am telling you that when you're trying to get the attention of local politicians here in the States, they may not care one bit about the great conservation and education work that your facility may be doing. 
but they will understand how many local constituents you employ, how much sales tax you bring into their district, the tourism dollars you might generate, and the jobs that are created by your infrastructure improvement projects. So I feel that our industry needs to leverage every angle we can to demonstrate the value that we bring, both in terms of conservation, education, and commerce. This project until very recently was known as the Zoo and Aquarium's All Hazards Preparedness Response and Recovery Fusion Center. Now that's our old logo on the right. We got to keep the acronym, but really that partnership piece is much more in line with describing the integration and the inclusion we aim to achieve with every one of our program objectives. And I think we've worked really hard at getting to know and including the owners, operators, and facilities that aren't part of the two largest accrediting groups of exotic animal exhibitors. That's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the Zoological Association of America. Membership in organized trade type associations bring value to their members, such as conferences, training opportunities, webinars, and the like. But we try to fill that gap for a wider audience. So let's talk a little bit more about the exotic animal industry in the United States. Well, I think we're really kind of hard to define. There's a myriad of species. We have megafauna, marine species, we have insects, amphibians, you name it. There can be just a tremendous variety in these different facilities. We have vastly different business models, private, nonprofit, private public partnerships. Some are subsidized with tax base, others are for profit enterprises that rely solely on gate receipts. We even include exotic game ranching community when we talk about the exotic animal industry. While hunting is their business model, some of you need to realize that these private game ranches have exquisite hoofstock collections among the most unbelievable in the world. So we want to include them at the table as well. And they are free to use anything that we develop that would help them during various incidents. We need a tremendous variety of equipment to manage our species regardless of our business model. And it is in scarce supply. It's incredibly difficult to safely move many of our species. In the US, there are maybe two or three companies that move elephants. And they may be anywhere in the US at any time. So it's not likely you're going to be able to pick up the phone and call them and have them arrive in a time of an emergency. You need to understand that for many of our species, our options are to prepare to safely shelter in place. We'll talk a, a little bit more about that later. Based on our collection of species and our locations, we face very different challenges and hazards. ZAP is the opportunity to share that information, understand the lessons learned when we go through different events, and hopefully learn and improve actions for the next event. The, the industry is under a myriad of different rules and regulations based upon species, primary business activity, and what state or county in which they reside. Chris Jerem from the Wellington Zoo yesterday gave a great explanation of the jurisdictional authority of zoos in New Zealand. In the United States, it's a real patchwork of oversight. Most of the animals you might think of as zoological species, if they are mammals used for exhibition purposes, they are regulated under the Animal Welfare Act. And I'm no academic scholar of the AWA, but suffice it to say, that it requires certain animal welfare standards to be met to be given a license to exhibit those animals. Now, there are USDA inspectors, truly our ZAP partners, that help us a great deal on all manner of subject matter expertise, and they receive special training and conduct inspections that allow this exhibition to occur. But not all zoo-type animals are regulated under the Animal Welfare Act. Reptiles are currently not included. Inclusion of birds has already gone under public comment process, but the requirement for birds are still being established. 
states view the holding of these species very differently. Some states have little to no oversight of these species. Others, such as Florida, has a much more organized Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission that has additional statutory authority over certain species. Endangered species have a whole nother layer of oversight. And believe it or not, some species are actually owned, not by the exhibitor, but, but by foreign countries. So there's often many considerations when it comes to understanding the regulatory nature of the, of the industry and therefore the partners that you need to engage in effective planning. So believe it or not, there is no one overarching requirement to have contingency plans in place. Some facilities have incredible plans. Others haven't really thought much about it if not required to do so. Suffice it to say, requirement or not, part of my job is to convince folks that there are multiple reasons that they must consider planning and provide them with some tools to do so. First of all, when incidents happen, it's important to have plans in place that will protect staff, the public, and the animals themselves. And we've heard time and time again in these presentations this week that we preach the concept of the incident command system. And that's understanding that human life, health, and safety comes first. So if we're planning and training, um, we're likely going to be much more successful in keeping responders safe, when, and that will hopefully result in safer animals and safer results overall. Many facilities participate in breeding of endangered species. Just Google this quote, 25 endangered animals you need to see before they disappear. I mean, obviously not now, after this talk is over, but there's some updates needed, but look at the US zoos that are mentioned in this article that are trying to keep these animals from disappearing from the planet. We have an obligation, if these species survival is our mission, to protect these animals in our care. We need to plan to protect ourselves and animal agriculture. Now, we don't want to deal with their disease issues, and we certainly don't, uh, excuse me, we don't want anything that might be in our facility to impact the agricultural sector. So we have to practice good biosecurity. And finally, it's smart business practice. If you rely on gate receipts to feed your animals and pay your staff, having a plan will likely get you back up and open faster. A very important consideration not to be overlooked is the fact that the public expects and frankly demands that we take good care of these animals in human care. This is Fiona. Um, Fiona is a hippopotamus um, with obviously her own Wikipedia page, but what's more impressive about Fiona is that she has 2 million fans on social media. Um, her story revolves around the fact that she was born quite premature and by Herculean efforts of the zoo animal care team, bringing in human pediatric specialists, they were able to save this little hippo's life and she's gone on to be this social media sensation with children's books and all these followers. So we have to recognize that she is really visible to the public. And do you remember April the Pregnant Giraffe? She had 1.2 million people watching her on live stream when she gave birth. Okay, these are the media stars in my world. And we have an obligation to protect them and all the creatures in our care that have such high societal visibility and value in the public. So I need to share with you just a bit of history. It's prehistoric. Um, to understand how we got to where we are with this program. So I was hired by Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago to assist a uh, cooperative agreement to prepare the zoological exhibitors for highly pathogenic avian influenza. And at that time, it was thought that that H5N1 strain of the bird flu would go on to become the next great human health pandemic. And while fortunately that didn't happen at that time, Working directly with USDA got the community to recognize that on the whole, 
we were unprepared to deal with the foreign animal disease outbreak of a zoonotic nature in our collections. Now, zoo, zoo vets are among the smartest people I have ever known, but we didn't understand the response process and how important it was for us to, to be partners in preparedness with our USDA. And we were able to craft some uh, guidance documents and training materials that represented that collaboration. And this is a cool little training that we developed with local Chicago art students to create an animated training program, which is still available on YouTube. It was primarily designed as an introduction to influenzas, so animal managers would understand the importance of recognizing signs of disease and encouraged reporting of ill animals as quickly as possible. We included an introduction that talked about the great influenza of 1918. And it's really quite eerie how much it reminds me of recent COVID conditions. Then came Hurricane Katrina. An analysis by the, of the storm by USDA suggested that the regulated animal exhibitors that had contingency plans in place when the storm hit fared better, recovered more quickly, and resumed operation faster than those that had not done pre-planning. So in 2008, USDA decided to amend that Animal Welfare Act to require licensed exhibitors to have contingency plans in place to deal with the hazards that were most likely to occur. And those two main accrediting groups, AZA and ZAA, require it of their members. But of the approximately 700 zoo type businesses in the US, less than 300 are members of those organizations. So depending on the state that they're in and other factors like I mentioned previously, plans may not be in place. So Dr. Kevin Dennison, who might actually even be on this call, of USDA Animal Care reached out to us to bring to, together a group of subject matter experts to develop guidance documents to help exhibitors understand the process of writing robust plans and collect those lessons learned and successful practices. Believe it or not, that proposed rule change to the Animal Welfare Act is still not enacted. It became a bit of a political football, but this is the way we first became involved in understanding the correct process of planning and response and bringing that information to our industry. So we assembled that great group of subject matter experts in, to produce those guidance documents covering these topics. And these documents are still available on our webpage. And when the process of updating these links with a little bit more contemporary information in those printed materials. But see over there in that right hand column, we have special considerations for emergency animal care, which includes thoughts about planning for sheltering zoo animals in place. Now these animals can be very dangerous under the best of circumstances. It may be in the best interest of animals and humans to shelter in place, but how are you going to accomplish that? If animals have to shelter in place, how much ration is held on grounds at any one time? Can you calculate that? What about water? How much water does your collection need as a minimum every day? If you are without water, that number would be extremely important to know. Should you need to request water up the appropriate communication chain? If you haven't given your local emergency management contacts that information, how will they have any idea what your needs might be? Next on that list, animal transportation and evacuation. And this document outlines information to consider when you draft evacuation plans. You do not go looking for crates, four wheel drive trucks and trailers when fire is rolling up the hill. And discuss with everyone what the trigger point is for evacuation. And if you evacuate, where do you go? Is moving the animals more dangerous than sheltering in place? Remember in hurricanes, people tend to all bug out at the same time. Animals stuck in a hot transfer truck on a slow moving highway is likely putting them at greater harm than a well thought out shelter in place plan. If you are going to evacuate completely or partially, your priorities must be understood ahead of time. Those crucial decisions should be made not in the heat of the moment, if at all possible. 
All this should be part of pre-planning to the best of your facility ahead of time. So once that cooperative agreement was moved from Lincoln Park Zoo to the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, this is an updated version that is narrated training modules and a workbook. We walk people through understanding who needs to be at the table as your planning partners, how to speak with them about your business model, your collection composition, and other important information that they have to know. We also provide templates to do a facility risk assessment because you, you should be planning for high likelihood, high consequence events. We challenge you to assess your needs and equipment limitations because we all have them. Um, you can't possibly own all the equipment that might be required in a big response. And finally, these modules help you to write the plan and to train and maintain your plan. These are currently on our website as well, and we'll be updating them this year with the help of San Diego Zoo Academy, and that is a premier online training portal for the zoological community. And this training and others that are produced by ZAP will be on that platform available and free of charge. To provide additional planning considerations for transboundary animal diseases, we have another project known as Secure Zoo Strategy. We learned so much from working on that early highly pathogenic avian influenza project, we needed to focus on additional disease planning guidance. And this group led by Dr. Jimmy Tickle created a 10 step planning tool for the exotic animal industry. We used the current USDA documents on the specific disease concerns from what's known as our FAB prep library and NAHEMS, the National Animal Health Emergency Management System guidance. But I have to give a special shout out to the Australian government's National Zoo Biosecurity Manual. That document was a huge help to us as we developed our materials and we reference it throughout. So again, I can't thank you guys enough. So I'd like to finish up with discussing some of the critical connections we've tried to foster between our industry and subject matter experts in training and response. ZAP is fortunate to be a non-voting member of the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition. And these are the NGOs that belong to NARSC are some of the subject matter expert boots on the ground for this type of work. So we're talking IFA, ASPCA, American Humane, and Red Rover, among others. We have learned a great deal from them about the process of animal emergency management. And our participation with the National Alliance of State Animal and Agricultural Emergency Programs, or NASEP, connects the exotic industry with those state representatives whose responsibility it is for planning for animals and disasters. And I really think this participation is mutually beneficial. Through NARSC, we were introduced to a Mr. Eric Thompson, who you also might have heard of, and he is with Code 3. And through some recent reorganization, he is now primarily involved with responder training and became really interested in the exotics world. He has since branched out to provide technical guidance and training working with exotic animal industry species. The skills and equipment in a technical response also has applications for us in animal health procedures. Now, this is, um, these a couple pictures here were provided to me by Eric. This is where Code 3 went out to help with an elderly elephant lift. Um, unfortunately, this elephant uh, went down in a rather inconvenient spot in the elephant barn. And many of you who have worked with geriatric equine lifts know that sometimes it's just a matter of trying to assist that animal to get on its feet and that it will be allowed to go on its merry way. Um, I want to point out a couple of things here for you. Uh, with Dr. Husted on, on the call, uh, you know, Rebecca and Eric as well, it's all about PPE. I mean, look at these, these folks in this enclosure on your left hand side with the helmets and you know as best protection as he possibly can and before we brought this to the attention of the zoological industry they had not really thought that much about how important it is to protect 
your head in, in, in these type of situations. And on the right, you can see that with the, with the help of Dr. Kathleen Becker, um, she supersized this lift equipment to begin to, you know, lift some of these incredibly heavy creatures. And, you know, look at the size of the straps. And um, so they've gone on through some, you know, understanding of, you know, how to kind of juggle these animals in the air with some of the subject matter experts that work with them every day. And he has really been very helpful in helping get some of these animals back on their feet. Eric also founded the Exotic Animal Strike Team, or EAST program, which was started in 2018 as the need for exotic specialists in disaster response. So what ZAMP is do, doing is we're assisting Eric in identifying partners to participate in this type of training for technical exotic responders. And it's hoped that eventually EAST will be added to our FEMA resource typing. So EAST teams have a direct link with emergency management and community planning and response. SAP also conducts organized meetings in several regions with two or three more planned for 2021. And sadly, while these things are going to be virtual, there has been overwhelming interest in regions continuing to organize themselves for response and recovery. And those meetings have really been a catalyst for that. Ms. Stewart, who I mentioned earlier, is assisting us with this particular task. The most organized group to date is known as ZDR3, and they're out of Texas. And they assisted three institu excuse me, institutions after two different hurricanes in 2020, logging 2,300 volunteer man hours spread across a number of those participating uh, zoo responders to assist with cleanup, construction, animal relocation for temporary housing, and other support functions. So this is our new website. Um, it's zap.org. Um, it's just been brought online in the last week, so we're still checking it out a bit for bugs and the like. Um, but please go to our website. Uh, on multiple pages, there's an opportunity for you to sign up to participate with us. And um, you will be notified. We try to send out what we call zap blasts about once a month or more frequently as needed. And, and that's your opportunity to learn when we're going to have webinars or other links of interest where you could click on those and be directed back to a particular um, page on our website or a blog post. If you're not COVID, you know, beyond your capacity to absorb anymore. Um, we do have a particular page of interest to zoos and aquariums or other uh, exhibitors that have exotic species. And what's really interesting about this is that we've collected a number of links from trusted resources from our Centers for Disease Control. There's a One Health um, you know, COVID working group that has a uh, wildlife and zoological species subgroup. Um, they provide information for this page. We have links to their, their page on CDC. Certainly our American Veterinary Medical Association, the European Association of Zoo and Wildlife Veterinarians, our own American Association of Zoo Vets. It's a really rich resource. Um, another thing that's really nice about this is we have subject matter experts from species survival plans and our taxon advisory groups. And these are individuals, veterinarians, as well as um, other paraprofessionals that, that work with these species all the time. And they have provided specific COVID recommendations for the management of these types of animals in their care. So this is how you can contact us. Again, just remember zap.org is our webpage. Um, there is Ms. Zielinski's email address. She's fantastic and has a great deal of connectivity with other AZA um, programs that might be of interest. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Lin is my wrangler at USDA. And here's uh, Mr. Thompson's email address again, as well as Mike Foraker. He is the lead of the ZDR3 and is always interested to know what other folks are doing in different areas across the US for organization for uh, response and recovery. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm free to take any questions. 
Thank you so much, Yvonne. That was a fabulous presentation. And, um, you know, I'm overwhelmed, I think, by the complexity. Uh, you, you know, I always knew that animal emergency management was complex, a complex environment, but talking about, um, you know, all the different elements uh, of, of your members and uh, the considerations is just um, mind blowing um, and fantastic resources as well. So we will make uh, an effort to make sure we get as many of those listed on our Facebook page and other places we have um, so that any attendees today can find those easily. Um, if you've got, sorry, if you've got any questions, please um, write those in the Q&A section. We have one question at the moment and I'm um, happy to take some more if you have uh, time, Yvonne. Sure. Um, okay. So uh, Erica says, as responders, when disaster strikes, we often encounter surprise exotic, uh, exotics sorry, that none of us is experienced with. Our first call is going to be um, to a pre-identified zoo contact for guidance. Do zoos tend to incorporate capacity for community consulting into their formal plans? I think that's a really good question. And I think that um, certainly many of your larger zoos that have a real knowledge of how important their resources are as, as well as their subject matter expertise certainly are very willing to participate. Um, you know, the other thing I, I didn't mention in the talk is um, we, we tried to get this information out to animal control officers as well, because oftentimes, you know, we hear these incidents, it may not involve a big zoo, but what if there's a situation where you've got someone that raises reptiles and there's a flooding situation and you've, you've got a, a house full of reptiles. Many times that might, the, the jurisdictional authority for animal management might fall on the animal control officer, right? So we try to make sure that they connect with, um, you know, those sort of subject matter experts, reach out to their local zoos and start that communication process at that local level. You know, when I like to say when I hear about something bad, then it's really bad because it wasn't handled at that local level. So, um, you know, that's something that I really encourage you to do. If you, if you are a zoological um, person working in that field, try to find out, you know, who has responsibility for animals first thing out of the gate at your facility. Mm, absolutely. Um, at the moment, we don't have any other questions, but I'm going to use the silence to ask one of my own, if that's okay. And if anyone Absolutely. has any questions here, please um, pop those in the Q&A or in the chat if you're a panellist. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in public communication and um, you know, your comments about your, your celebrity animals, the followings they have, um, the importance of zoos for, you know, for, um, for local employment and a whole range of other things. Um, clearly, they're, they're, they're often in the spotlight for a whole lot of reasons. And of course, the opportunity for, for outrage um, when a, a zoo doesn't do what people expect it to do, for example, doesn't evacuate the animals when people, you know, the, the general public feels that's what they should be doing. Um, right. I was just wondering if in, your, in, in, if in any of your planning, there is um, that sort of preemptive consideration of, of managing the public expectations um, in some kind of emergency event. Well, I think that's a that's a, a really good question, and and we could spend a, an entire workshop talking about that. But I think I think if you you follow good planning process and you get the people engaged at your local level that you need to have, you have an opportunity to to meet you know you want to meet the people in that emergency operations center, right? So you need to, you need to meet that public information officer that, that is going to be speaking for that emergency. And you need to have whoever is speaking on, on your, your public information officer for your zoo, you need to be on the same page and you need to have a strategy that, and I'll, I'll this is another Kevin Dennison phrase, I'll, I'll tell you. It, I would much rather have a zoo standing up in that press conference with the emergency management, with their entire team of responders and say, we had a plan and we all agreed on this plan and no plan is ever 100% effective. And you know, we all did the best we could possibly do given the situation and we will take this and learn from it. We will not, you know, we will not forget what has happened and we will learn from it and move forward. And then that way, I think it really helps 
um, diminish some of the blame game if you are able to talk about that collaboration you had before the incident occurred. Yeah, that no, sounds good advice. Um, okay, well, I don't think we've got any more questions for you, Yvonne, so um, we'll wrap up there. Um, thank you so much for your time today. We really enjoyed your presentation. We've had some fabulous um, similar sort of comments made, you know, we've got lots of reinforcement of some of the comments you've made around PPE, around injuries, around training, around the sort of balancing some of those skills as well. Oh, oh, I've just got one more question actually, now I'm wrapping up. So maybe I'll ask that because it's nice to make, um, to, to have that time. Um, so, sorry, Vivi asks, have you ever reached out to American Association of Animal Sanctuaries? Um, they often have members with exotics. Absolutely. We include them in our conversations. Um, we also, um, uh, through um, our relationship with NARSC, we work with a number of those entities like International Fund for Animal Welfare that is very heavily involved in sanctuary work. So we work with them. As a matter of fact, on that uh, subject matter group that we had that, that produce those first documents. We had representatives from the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. And we also include some folks that are involved in, um, uh, in you know, native wildlife rehabilitation because they can use a lot of our planning tools as well to do their own risk assessments and to understand how to write plans. So we, we cast, you know, we cast a big tent. It's like, there's a lot of stuff here take and use what works. And that's why we don't even like to use the word best practices because best practices for one facility is not best practices for another. It's always about considerations, lessons learned, take what is good, what you need to best prepare your, you know, your own unique facility. Great. Well, thank you for taking that extra time. I'm sorry for the false finish. Um, but uh, as I said, yeah, we've had lots of, um, of reinforcing messages, I think, in the, in the conference generally. So, you know, the injuries, the training, the importance of those practical skills when we can get them again. Um, so thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank um, you. So, so attendees, um, this is the end of this presentation. We have the next one coming up. Um, we have quite a long gap now. So we have six hours before or five and a half hours before we have our next presentation. And that is going to be from um, um, Sibyl um, Senges from Turkey, who's going to be talking about some um, CBRN risks um, for search and rescue dogs. So that sounds like another interesting uh, and different presentation to add to the mix. So thank you so much and we'll hopefully see you all later. Thank you.